Financial Phil is with us via telephone. Philip, good morning to you. How are you guys? I'm free. <laughs> well, I was, I'm, kind of, I'm a little concerned about you, Rob. If he's killing you for free, yeah. then that tells me there's something in the back of his mind. You see, you're he's you're getting the message, <laughs> Phil. You're getting the message he's been missing all along. <laughs> oh, no, I haven't been missing it. I just don't care. He's ignoring it. Yeah. yeah, like you're just reading his book. Like every time someone, someone gets killed, his name is Rob or Mario. It's, 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 it's got to be concerning. Is it I Rocco? Would be a little nervous. Uh, is it Rocco in it's your Rocco. book? Yeah, yes. it's Rocco in, in his book. My, even my, worse. My, my intended name. Even worse. So I, I would be, if I read one of his books and I saw that Financial Field was getting killed off, I'd be like, hey, what, <laughs> what's going on here? No, I, you know, Especially I, if I didn't pay for it. The, the thing is, Phil, I'm, I'm used to hostility. It's just a natural <laughs> part of my personality. <laughs> the elections are over. You don't have to. You don't have to be used to it anymore. You know, no, he gets it. Over. He gets them both sides here in the studio. <laughs> I, I just have a natural way of bringing out hostility from people. You know, I've kind of perfected you do that it. To me sometimes in the morning. So yeah, I, I would. I, I do see that. You yeah. do that to me sometimes in the morning. Hey, I'll so. call you all jolly. First thing in the morning, and next thing you know, eight minutes later, I, I'm mad. <laughs> <laughs> See, this, I told you, this it's is what gift. I do. I'm able to bring out hostility in the happiest of people. Make me mad about something about things that we both agree on. <laughs> I don't know how you do. That. I told you, it's an art. This is what I do. This is <laughs> what I, I foment. Go around and grumble and take it out on my wife and kids. <laughs> we're just trying to get ready for school. <laughs> it's your fault. Uh, hey. All because of Mario. And I, I accept yeah. all responsibility. It's I'm completely the person responsible. Yeah. If you look on that Zabruder film, I'm only 10 months old, but I'm on that. No, that's me. Uh, Phil, uh, I saw that the S&P 500 index is up 17% over the last six months. The Russell 2000, small stocks, small caps, same thing. The Dow up 14%. So if you're looking at it from a six-month perspective, though we've had a few rocky months here and there, that's a pretty good half a year. Yes, it is, and it's been a, it's been a good year. I mean, if you could if you can take out, um, you know, if we just look at 2024, if you just take out April, and we had said that in April, then that's why it's so scary. Is when you have falls like we did in April, it is part of a bull market and it's part of a bear market. So it's it's hard to say what's the next move when things like that happen. But so far in May, and remember the old saying, "Go away in May." That hasn't played out yet, and it's been basically because the rate of inflation has changed course just the smallest amount, and the Federal Reserve did not have rate increases on the table, so our markets have kind of soared. But we've been really looking forward to NVIDIA earnings all for the last three months since their last earnings. We've really been looking forward to that to see if there's another bump that we can get from NVIDIA and, and this pace of the artificial intelligence and how it's benefited a lot of different companies, Microsoft and Google and a lot of the megatechs that have been supported simply by NVIDIA earnings. So I think uh, Wednesday after the bell is really, really important for this next leg of the market to see if megatech can continue to do what it has done so far. But, you know, back to the Dow, we, had, we touched on that this morning, and I kind of dismissed the Dow a lot. Maybe I shouldn't, but I do. I dismissed the Dow a lot because I think the S&P is a better indicator of how our market, the health of our markets. But what we see with the Dow that has doesn't have as much tech in it as the S&P and, of course, the NASDAQ, it has done extremely well, and it's getting a lot of attention for closing and opening over that, that 40,000 mark, but it's kind of catching up some, and it's broadening of the, the of our overall markets where it's not just tech, and that is a positive sign as well. So it's been a pretty good May. Hopefully it continues on. Uh, NVIDIA will tell us a lot on Wednesday. I was uh, surprised to see the Russell 2000 index had done as well as those numbers show, Phil, because – I look at uh, my wife works for the federal government, so it's TSP is what they call the 401k. And I was just looking at a report where the, they, have a, they have an S&P fund, they have international, uh, they have uh, uh, the, a small cap. And the small cap had only done 5% year to date, whereas the S&P and even international had done well in excess of 5%. So I, I guess it depends on what your benchmark starting point is as to what these returns are. 
But in that time period, from January 1 onward, I was uh, not impressed by the small cap stock performance. However, over six months, it turns out to be a lot better. And also the yeah. four also, the 401k is doing well. So a lot of the standards, all the parameters are looking very good. But yet, folks still have the impression that the economy is in the tubes. Because everything is a hell, lot, hell of a lot more expensive than it was the, a couple of years the ago. The economy is in the tubes? What does that even mean? <laughs> in the tube. It means the same thing as in the tank. You see how you make people mad? We all knew what that <laughs> You see how you make people mad? <laughs> it's just that's well, Bill's it, mixed metaphor again, of the day. It, 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 it's our our perception is, I guess, depending upon where we stand. And if you're in the grocery store and you're buying things, just like John said, nobody's going to walk into a grocery store and walk out and say, "Hey, our economy's doing great," because of how expensive everything is. But I still maintain that that consumer strength and that strength being that we're still willing to purchase these things and walk out. Some of them are discretionary, and some of them are consumer staples where you must buy them. But we're still doing those things like traveling, like buying homes, which still blows my mind that the housing market hasn't completely crashed, quite honestly, because of how expensive it is, the cost of borrowed money, in relation to what it was a few years ago. Now, I guess that, that also depends on who you are because we all have, well, not all of us, but there's stories about, oh, the first home I bought, it was at 15%. And then then you have those that, you know, the younger generations, like, well, the first home I bought was at 3% or 2.5%. So I guess that also depends on where you're standing on your perception of the economy. But how it's measured and how it's measured is consumer spending, consumer sentiment, what's the jobs market look like, all those data points look healthy, and it's kind of led us. It, it's it's a it's a double edged sword because on one hand it's prevented the Federal Reserve or give them an excuse anyway for not decreasing rates. Say we can hold off. Why would we decrease rates? Because all these data points look healthy, but on the other side, it's kind of given us a boost because it's calmed our fears about a recession. So it it, it just depends on how you're looking at it. Uh, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. For us, with their blinders on, as we look at the markets, and let's go all the way back to 2022, which was a terrible year. 2022 was awful, and it was awful on all points. You know, you had the bonds that didn't do well, and the bonds still hadn't recovered, but the stock market didn't do well. Small caps didn't do well. Nothing did well in 2022, but for the most part, and with a, a balanced and diversified portfolio, you've probably made up for those losses in 2022 as we set close to the middle of 2024. And I think that's a positive. And that's why I'm always kind of taking up for the Federal Reserve, because they've been on the forefront of all of that. They were on the forefront in 2022 as well. You know, we wouldn't have had those falls if they weren't increasing rates at the pace that they were. But at the same time, if it wasn't for the Federal Reserve slowing down and stopping and kind of holding their cards as far as decreasing rates and allowing inflation to so so marginally slow down. And I mean, that's really what we're talking about. There was a marginal slowdown in the rate of inflation at the last reading, which is why we got this boost. But you do have to give them some credit that our markets, just on the market front, just our markets have recovered by and large and portfolios had recovered the losses from 2022 so far. And that you'll fill with us here on the program. Go ahead, John. I just everything we talk about today, certainly this morning, everything is swimming along for affluent boomers. You know, folks who can remember the fifteen percent mortgage rates back when we bought our first houses and all of that. That's that's wonderful. The people who are getting left behind are the younger folks who are just trying to enter the market. They're not buying houses right now. I just read an article about this that the the uh, it's just like people aren't leaving their jobs. People aren't selling their homes. They're not leaving their their two percent or three percent mortgage rates behind. Um, the the interest rate I heard on the radio yesterday. The interest rate that we're paying the, the United States is paying on its loans, its uh, uh, on its debt, is two million dollars a minute. Uh, wow. uh, and so we're on this this rocket ship to ob oblivion and we i just i think we spend too much time there's no i don't know if there's a question at the end of this or not we're just spending too much time looking at the markets and saying wow look at those 401ks aren't aren't we comfortable and not spending enough time looking 
at the abyss that, that lies ahead. And I don't know how to fix it. I'm not smart enough to do that. But I, I, I just think there's a sleight of hand that's going on saying, hey, look, be comfortable. We're still traveling. You can, you know, you, you, you're making a lot of money in your savings account. Don't worry. See, now, Phil, that to me is a negative, pessimistic attitude brought about by an angry person who didn't have his jello this morning. <laughs> Bill and I are pretty happy this morning. Gilstrap's cranky. That was a cranky thought. Well, it, it's a concern that he has uh, about the future of the economy and how can we keep up this pace. And I think from, you know, we and, we, and maybe I put too much emphasis on the Federal Reserve and their ability to spark our economy with interest rates. But what they're essentially saying to us is, look, we, we have this maybe arrogance that we can cut rates at any moment and spur the economy on. And I agree with you where there, there is a section of our population that, you know, younger people, and I don't, I don't know what their ages would be, maybe 20, 22 through 28 maybe, that simply are out of the market for a first-time home buyer. But I'm going to bring another two sections of the economy in that we never talk about. And those two sections are high school and college age workers who are still under the umbrella of their parents and people that have transitioned into retirement. I'm retired. I don't really need a paycheck, but I'm working for maybe a short term goal like a vacation or a car, or I'm just spending time because I, I don't have anything to do. I'm still healthy, so I'm I'm going to I'm going to wait a table, or I'm going to work a, a summer job. We have so many people that work that are retired educators that are retired that are working in factories during the holidays just for somewhere to go. Those people are a big part of our economy because it's 100 percent discretionary income that most of them are earning. So you take my daughters, who I use as a micro example all the time. Now I don't let them do this. But as they work, you know, they're still under mom and dad's umbrella. They don't really need, they don't have bills. They don't have a, a, a lot of responsibilities to spend that income on. Those kids are spending money like crazy because they're making money like they never have before. You know, you look at my two children. One is uh, g getting ready to be a senior in high school, and the other is senior in college, getting ready to start her graduate degree. Well, Abigail, who you guys know she was in there once, but when Abigail started working, that she got nine bucks an hour, and she thought it was pre-COVID, and she thought that was the greatest thing ever. Well, it was time for Ada to get her first job, and it was nine and a quarter, and she kind of scoffed at it. She was like, nine dollars and twenty-five cents is that it? And that that change of attitude came from COVID, and how much more entry level and exit level positions were paying, which is what she would be what she would be qualified for. Entry and exit level positions, and now those kids make so much more money than what they did before, and that is supporting this consumer spending to an extent. And we have clients that do the same thing that are making more money uh, working a transition job close to what they made while they were working full-time pre-retirement, and that's all discretionary income that they can still go on vacation or buy a vehicle or buy something that isn't a, a staple, something that is a must. They can use that money for that, and that's where these wage supports and some of these these job reports that we get when we see that the wages have continued, and I'm not saying that they, they've kept up with the rate of inflation, but if wages are higher, then the Federal Reserve looks at that and says, well, hey, that, that's a strong consumer. That's a consumer we know that's going, by and large, is going to be willing to spend. And if they're still willing to spend, that's an inflationary pressure. Therefore, I'm not going to reduce rates. But the last report showed that, we, and we've stacked a few of these job reports that had shown some decline in some of those numbers, and that's why it's strange. It is. Bad news is good news. A decline in the health of our job markets have been, in large part, especially in May, have caused this bump that we've gotten. Phil, uh, a lot of some perception, and I'm going to pick up on something John said earlier, that the homeowners uh, were getting older and older when we buy the home. Uh, for first-time home home buyers in, uh, in the 1980s is around 29 years of age. And uh, t today it's 35 years of age. So there is, uh, we have this perception that everything is so much more difficult to buy homes today than it was many years ago but it's really not the case no not at all it may have been when i came into the market or you know, people that were buying homes in 2005 forward it may be a little bit more difficult 
financially. But like you said, and that's kind of the world we live in because our, our, our client base age, you know, when you talk to them, they, they don't they don't scoff at 6 7% mortgage rates because they know what they were in the 80s. And they're, they're kind of like, you guys are spoiled. And they're right to an extent where it historically, where we're setting on mortgage rates historically isn't that bad. But if you cut that history back to, say, 2000 seven, eight, nine, and forward, it is pretty bad, and it's much more expensive than what it was before. And I'm still surprised. I would have guessed, and, and I would have been wrong, that because of the people that are in the 25 or 3% mortgages are unwilling to get out of those, that it would have caused more damage to the, to the housing market, which I would anticipate still going to happen but it would have caused more damage to the housing market than what it has so far. Bill, but that that two and a half or three percent mortgage is the reason why the housing market hasn't collapsed, because it is it has kept less houses on the market, which has kept the price high. But it's but, supply and demand. If yeah. you've got a two and a half percent mortgage, and you're trying to move up, maybe get a bigger house, you're not moving. Because I want to give up my two and seven eighths percent mortgage for a seven, so I'll stay where I am until let, rates come down. Therefore, re- less inventory. Let me reinforce your point, and please, I don't, please do that because yeah. Gilstrap looked like he wanted to disagree. <laughs> no, I I was uh, talking about first time buyers. If we're talking about repeat buyers, then the spread is much greater. Today, it's around fifty eight. Uh, years of age for repeat buyers and it had been down as low as about 40 40 uh, uh, below 40 so it's gone up substantially for the repeat buyers but the first time buyers has not been that much change uh, john how old were you when you bought your first house uh mid-20s phil how about you same i was uh 24 i think yeah i was i was 25 and i was 35 but you were in the military. I was in the military. You were floating around the world, so there's no real reason for a house on land, right? So um, my kids are 26 and 29, and neither owns a home. The 26-year-old's kind of looking into that right now, but the, 30, the one who's about to be 30 isn't close to that. Uh, so there, there's a but, couple of examples there. But why? Because of financial uh, not, or just uh, financials, not financials one, and uh, he's not. In, my my younger one's close to getting married, so that's kind of when you start to think yeah. that way. Uh, my twenty nine year old's not even anywhere in the zip code of marriage at this time in his life, and I think that has something to do. I, with I think so too. I, what I was, uh, the point I was trying to make is that we look at this as strictly financial driven, right? Uh, but it's not totally financial. Sometimes driven. it's family driven, yeah. right? Uh, Phil, just about out of time here, uh, so uh, let's wrap it up by you telling us how we get in touch with you for more information. Uh, you can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Oh, and, and by the way, did we say what was coming up this week that was going to be driving the markets? I think you had mentioned in your 638 in, report, NVIDIA is reporting this week. NVIDIA, NVIDIA earnings after the close on Wednesday, so Around 5 o'clock on 5, 530 on Wednesday, uh, I think that will be the most significant thing that happens in our markets this week. All right, Phil, thank you very much. As always, we appreciate your time. Thank you, guys. Have a Thanks, good Phil. You can catch Phil each weekday morning at 638 for two minutes, setting up the business day report there and repeated in the morning at 738. 